Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Focus. This is the AE 9-11 Truth podcast, where we dive deep into the engineering evidence, the controlled demolition evidence of Towers 1, 2, and 7 of the World Trade Center on September 11th, 2001. And uh, this is where we bring on also our panel of engineers, our familiar faces who have been talking about this issue for years. And this is going to be a very special episode tonight. And why is that? Because earlier this week, and you might have noticed that we've been doing a lot more on social media lately, putting out some cool reels, video memes and such. And I was looking for just the basic clip of Building 7 coming down <clears throat> or just some new angles or whatever. I go to YouTube, I type in WTC7, of course, all 9-11 truth stuff, which is mostly focusing on World Trade Center 7 for the last 15, 16, whatever so years <clears throat> since this has been getting talked about, uh, is completely wiped. And what comes up at the very top of the search results is this right here. Collapse of Building 7, the complete physics. This is by Sabin civil engineering and that is the top video it's got somewhere in the hundreds of thousands of views and so youtube is telling you this is the video to watch if you want to know what happened to world trade center seven sabin civil engineering what is sabin civil engineering well it's uh run by a guy named matthew sabin he's a robotics engineer he received a master's degree in mechanical engineering from uh the website says is iit delhi and he claims this channel is the largest engineering channel <clears throat> on YouTube. So while he's not physically present here on The Focus tonight, he's going to be part of this show because we're going to be bringing on our engineers to uh, go over this video and you know tell us if the points that he makes in this, you know, telling you that the controlled demolition hypothesis uh, has no evidence to back it up, if the points that he makes – are really valid. And of course, I just want to point this out <clears throat> because they've scrubbed 9-11 truth from the search results. Uh, here we have a show called The Focus, but my regular show is called 9-11 Freefall. For, so just for my own curiosity, I typed 9-11 Freefall into the YouTube search uh, bar. And you, it's not even just featured on AE 9-11 Truth YouTube channel, because there used to be a YouTube channel called 9-11 Freefall, and we put that in there. Of course, what you get is a bunch of mainstream media stuff. You'll notice that I've got the Invisible Man playing there in the uh, bottom left-hand corner, because that is what you become when you talk about physics and common sense when it comes to September 11th. The World Trade Center collapses, the destruction of those buildings through the use of pre-planted explosives. They want to scrub that from the search results. <clears throat> I'm sure you can find me if you jump through a bunch of hoops. But for anybody who's casually looking for this, they want to scrub it from those results and shove this video down your throat. So you would think that it's going to be very important that it's going to have all of its facts straight, wouldn't you think? Well, we're going to be running that through uh, our own uh, meat grinder tonight with our engineers. Of course, our first one here is Mr. Roland Angle. Roland is the chairman of AE 9-11 Truth. He graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, with a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering, served in the U.S. Army Special Forces, where he was trained in the use of explosives and became a licensed civil engineer in California. 50 years of engineering experience has included uh, designing and testing blast-hardened missile launch facilities, and designing U.S. naval explosive containers, harbor terminal facilities, earth foundation systems, and hydraulic systems. In addition, he's owned three construction companies, and he's taught engineering subjects to high school students. He's going to be joined by our general manager and board member here at AE. This is Kamal Obeid. Uh, he uh, holds a master's degree in civil engineering from the University of California, Berkeley, been a practicing civil and structural engineer in the San Francisco Bay Area since 1980 and a licensed structural engineer since 85. He specializes in structural steel building analysis as well as investigating structural failures of steel frame buildings. And at one point, he actually served as a volunteer for FEMA, investigating earthquake failures, and is a longtime member of the Structural Engineers Association of Northern California. And they, of course, are joined by Mr. John Schuler, who is a civil engineer. He's got a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from Lehigh University, Master of Science in Civil Engineering from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, 
and he is a volunteer with Project Due Diligence and very prolific in that capacity. So gentlemen, we've had a chance to look at this. Of course, we're going to be watching this video tonight. I'm going to try to fit the show into one hour. I don't know if that's possible, but we're going to try. But we're going to go over the hour if we need to uh, uh, tonight. Uh, just again, just a reminder, audience, this is the number one video when you type in WTC7 in a YouTube search result. Everybody's getting their information. Any casual person who may have heard, oh, you know, I heard that was brought down with bombs on 9-11. Anybody who looks into this is probably watching this video while Andy Steele and Roland Engel and all the others are relegated to the back pages of... Uh, of the search results. So just as a quick flash of Mr. Sabin's uh, website, uh, I don't have the URL there in front of me, but that's his about me. Knows a lot about robots. He's a mechanical engineer, as I said. So I guess what we're going to do is we're just going to play this in a few parts. We're going to go through the entire video tonight, and uh, we're going to get everybody's commentary after these segments play. So this first part of this video is about two and a half minutes long. Let's watch. On the evening of September 11, 2001, after the world witnessed the tragic collapse of the World Trade Centers, a nearby building mysteriously collapsed, the WTC-7. How did this almost perfect-looking building collapse? The key to this mystery lies in this video footage. Did you notice a sharp V-shaped dent at the top of the building well before the main collapse? This was the penthouse of WTC-7. Exactly below this dent, you'll be able to observe the three main columns of the building. You can conclude that this dent happened simply because these three columns collapsed. The WTC-7 also had a perimeter tube design. 24 central core columns carried the main weight of the building. The core and perimeter tubes were connected using many horizontal girders. Unlike the other buildings, the WTC-7 had a penthouse, which carried heavy cooling equipment. Let's simplify the geometry of the girders for an easier-to-understand visual. You can see the penthouse of the building was structurally supported by the core columns. Here comes another twist. All 24 of these core columns do not extend all the way to the ground directly like this. When construction of the WTC-7 began, there was already an electrical substation on the site. Although the authorities didn't want to demolish this building, the location of the substation was interfering with some core columns. Exactly eight core columns. This gave rise to a rather clever idea. These eight interfering core columns were taken out horizontally to the substation and finally connected to the ground via these transfer trusses. By observing this visual, you'll get a clear idea about how the load of these eight trusses were transferred to the ground. This structural technique is known as transfer truss method. The issue's not over yet. Few perimeter columns of WTC-7 were also interfering with the substation. They were also connected to the ground via transfer trusses. Even though eight columns are not connected to the ground directly, these transfer trusses made sure that the central columns are still strong. Please keep the details of the structural connections in your mind. They'll play an important role in understanding the collapse of WTC-7. Okay, so that is the first segment, and I want to open it up with Roland. Get a reaction from you, and also if you can address, because he says three main columns in this, uh, and focus in on, I know, because I know they carried the most load, because they could be considered the main columns in this whole process. But give us your thoughts. Well, this is a piece of propaganda that's aimed at the general public, most of whom have no training or understanding of of how this system or any high-rise system is put together. So it relies on the typical tools of propaganda, which are omission, distortion, and actual fabrication of uh, information that is not accurate. So they focus, uh, first, they, they make a number of assumptions mm -hmm. here, and they use this cartoon 
video uh, to explain what they say is the complete physics, which is a, a complete lie on its face because the complete physics of the way this structure operated that day are complex. It was a 47-story uh, building after all. And if you want to look into the complete physics, it's going to take you months, really, of uh, research. And we've done it for years. And this whole thing is being presented in the, uh, without explaining, actually, that there is a controversy in the, in the field, in the field of structural engineering, because there's the official narrative that claims that this was a progressive collapse when the uh, columns at the east side of the building collapsed and caused a collapse of all the core columns and then the perimeter columns, and then that's what brought the building down. That's the official narrative. And then there's the narrative that we have uncovered and done research into with the University of Alaska report, which says that the building and the way in which the building came down can only be explained by removing all the columns in the building over eight stories at once. And that's the only way you get the building to behave in the manner in which we see. So this video doesn't, doesn't really explain that controversy. It doesn't really want to talk about that. But everything that they present here is a, uh, an attempt to justify the official narrative. In other words, they're going to claim that this building came down because uh, of the reasons that NIST gave namely collapse of these three columns, then a collapse of the core columns, and then a collapse of the perimeter columns, and that explains why the building failed. So this is, a, this is a, an argument that attempts to buttress the official narrative, and it does that by omission and a distortion of a lot of the facts. So, and they use these very clever computer simulations to uh, explain what they're talking about. And of course, the computer simulations are neither accurate nor complete. So uh, this is uh, an amateurist attempt to convince people with a very short uh, narrative here that the official narrative is correct and anybody who says differently uh, is incorrect. So first of all, let's talk. He, he focuses in on the fact that, uh, first of all, he makes a false statement when he says that the core columns carry the main gravitational load of the building. If you actually analyze the load on the columns, you see that the perimeter columns carried over half of the gravity load of the building. That's fact number one that he, he, he pretends as if, well, the core columns are carrying most of the load of the building. And he even makes a statement later on that the perimeter columns are like a cereal box and don't have any strength. So that, that's a distortion of reality. Uh, and as an engineer uh, and somebody who should know better, uh, he knows that that's wrong. And he hasn't done the investigation to prove what he's saying. So that's a, that's a red flag right there. So then he talks about the fact that uh, many of the core columns and the perimeter columns uh, didn't go down straight into the ground because of the substation below it. And so they had to be brought into transfer beams and carried outside of the uh, substation and then put into the ground with caissons. Well, that fact is irrelevant to uh, the NIST official story because the NIST official story does not claim that the uh, connections to those transfer trusses had anything to do with the uh, collapse of the building. And he, he further makes the claim later on in the video you'll see that those trusses were heated to 600 degrees centigrade, and that's what caused them to uh, buckle, and that's what caused the three columns to buckle. Well, that's not what NIST says at all. So he's he's distorting the NIST story, the official story, without any evidence, and without and there's no there's nobody that studied this that makes that claim. Yet he claims that that's what happened, and there's no factual basis to back it up. All the steel that was in the building was carried away for the most part. And the studies that they did on the temperatures that the steel had uh, uh, been subjected to in the building, the maximum temperature that they came up with any of that steel was 250 degrees centigrade. So there's absolutely no physical evidence to back up his claim that those transfer trusses were heated to 600 degrees centigrade. So he's right away uh, making up his own facts 
There's no physical evidence or test to prove any of the, any of that. And so uh, this is this is his beginning. The other thing I'd like to point out is that his 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 video is not a complete video, and it's inaccurate in many respects. He leaves out all the floor connections to the columns, which makes you believe that it would be easy for those columns to coll to collapse. And yet, at each one of the 47 stories on the building, there were three connections to that critical girder, the first girder, 79. I mean, the uh, column 79, and those. When you support a, a column in that fashion, it makes it very difficult for it to uh, collapse mm. because it's stiff. So uh, he leaves out all those details because he wants to make his point with inaccurate and incomplete information. So anyway, that's that's just that's where I'll start. <laughs> yeah, he makes the reference to the, the temperatures in a later segment here, just to clarify for our audience, and you will see that. I wanted to ask you, and I'm glad you brought up the substation reference, because one of my questions was, was how much of a factor is the substation in the collapse? And you basically said it's it's not really relevant. Um, so it, is, is it safe for me to say that he's taking some kind of unique feature of the building and kind of drawing people's attention to that, but it basically just, it, it, it's, it has nothing to do with the issue being debated because even uh, NIST is saying that this isn't really playing into the, uh, the the fall of this building on September 11th. Well, that's that's part of his technique is to tell you something that you may not know about the building to convince you that he knows a lot more about this than you do. Most people aren't familiar with, this, with the uh, way that the, loads were carried down into the foundation and they had to go either through the substation or around the substation. And so that's a detail. It's, it's an important detail. That aspect of it was correct in his portrayal, but it has nothing to do with the way the building came down. And nobody claims that. NIST doesn't claim that. We don't claim that. Nobody that studied this has any uh, uh, made any allegations that what happened with those transfer trusses had anything to do with the way the building came down. Right. And I'm, I don't really see anything in this where he backs up. Uh, it almost is just sort of like a guess. That's my opinion as a non-engineer. I want to hear from uh, the other engineers here. We'll start with Kamal. Your reaction to what you saw and uh, anything that you might have heard Roland just say right now. Well, well. So I. Uh, it's very, very interesting. A very impressive animation, I must say, that... Uh, uh, was put together at very nice cartoons, no question about that. And um, it, it begs the question, I mean, they, they, I don't think Saban Engineering would do this out of the goodness of their heart as a, as a public service. It, it'll be interesting to know who paid for this type of uh, propaganda and I mean, why, why they're putting it out now. My guess is that they're basically trying to debunk or, you know, throw uh, doubt on everything we've done. And what we've done, what AE has done, is a very comprehensive study that is um, that is very detailed and basically covers, and we've talked about this so many times on, on this program and other programs, that um, the, the it, our study basically uh, is looks at every little detail in the building and how possibly could have collapsed. It, it actually follows the NIST study and basically tries to duplicate what, what NIST has done uh, or what, they, what their theories are. And even with that, uh, the, the building, uh, the, the, uh, Professor Holsey could not show that the building collapsed the way it actually did. It wasn't until the, um, as, as everybody knows, it wasn't until it, uh, Dr. Hulsey basically uh, created the model where he pulled out uh, all the columns, it, it basically destroyed multiple columns, all of the columns at, at, uh, along eight stories height of a building. And that's the only way that the building could collapse the way it actually did. So now uh, we have this, um, assertion or maybe it's basically trying to defend the NIST theory maybe not but again i mean like roland says and i agree with that entirely it's it's really sensational to show that okay the building was built and the columns 
came down and, and they did not actually get, get down to the to the foundation around the, the substation. But uh, even this says the collapse occurred, started uh, occurring at the 13th floor or somewhere around there, where that's what caused the building to come out. So it's completely irrelevant that these that uh, that the building is supported on trusses that uh, basically span over the the uh, substation. Uh, so uh, it's sensational, I must say, and it's sensational for a reason. So this has been thought through, in my opinion, and it's, it's put together in such a way to, to, to give the doubting public um, a simple way to basically uh, believe the, the official story. But the nice thing about it, who paid for this? I mean, that's the thing that would be very interesting because this is not a cheap uh, animation. And, uh, and and who paid, who is Saban Engineering? The robotics, I mean, who are these people? And what, what are they doing that? What, why? What's the pro what's the situation? They, these are questions, I guess, that, that uh, should be answered. Um, well, he claims to be the largest engineering channel on YouTube. I, I don't know what uh, metric you base that on, but I want to say to the audience, what, what Roland and Kamal have talked about, where you have this kind of misdirection, like, oh, and the substation is here and the trusses get bent this way because of that way. This is why in high school, when you're taking an SAT and you get one of those complicated word problems, <clears throat> they they do this deliberately. They'll, they'll give you some kind of problem and then they'll throw in some irrelevant information to distract you. And what they're testing is, is if you can, you're mentally in a few seconds can sort out what the irrelevant stuff is from the relevant stuff in the problem and give the correct answer that way. That's why they give you those questions. Yeah. I, and they're and testing your add, intelligence that I, way. I want to add what Roland said is, is precise, precisely correct. We, we, of, of the animation model, that model shows the columns, like they're freestanding columns going up the, the full height of the building without interconnecting beams and the uh, what's very very important uh, for uh, people who are looking at this to understand is that these interconnecting beams uh, beams play a, vert, a, a vital role in, in supporting the building and preventing it from from global collapse like it did uh, and and I think this debunked their own theories uh, with their animation when they put that together where they tried to basically be truthful to the model by taking down the inside of the building that that, that what what he's calling the the main columns of the building inside uh, column 79 and what happens is that the building crumples because of the way it's held together if, if you do that so Right, well, he's going to make a big deal out of this twist you'll see in later segments uh john i want to give you a chance to give your thoughts on the uh on everything being said in that first segment. Yeah, Andy, not a whole lot to add. Uh, I agree with everything Roland and Kamal have just said. Um, it's a clownish cartoon. Why it would be put out by this firm 22 years, at, 23 years after 9-11, why it's the number one ranked, you know, find on YouTube when you type in WTC7, and, um, you know, it, it appears to be something between propaganda, childish cartoon, and complete nonsense. It's just very odd. Um, yes, the animation is so primitive, it's ridiculous. The way it's even referred to by the narrator, who is not Sabine, as we'll see. I, but, you know, he's calling it a tubular structure, something like that. He said, uh, well, it's not. This is a traditional steel frame building. The Twin Towers were known for having that tubular type of construction. This one is not. So the terminology is wrong. The, uh, again, not showing any of the cross, you know, cross members, the connections. It's um, total misdirection from the start. So it's really, it's it's just really bad on so many levels. It's so, so childish and um, asinine, really. Well, we're just getting started here. We got yeah, yeah it gets four worse. other segments to go. So let's just go ahead and jump into the next one. From the north side, this building looks intact. But let's turn the camera to the south side. This was the true condition of the building, enduring a huge fire with a big gash on the perimeter columns. This is real video footage of the World Trade Center Building 7 from the opposite angle. You can see clearly here that the fire in the building was spreading on a large scale. 
you can imagine the damage it must have caused in the building. The WTC-7 had fires on multiple floors, burning over several hours. Because firefighters were busy saving the lives of those in the collapsed WTC-1 and 2, they were unable to suppress the fire in this building. Did you notice a long gash on the south side of the building? How exactly did this happen? The only way the perimeter columns of WTC-7 create such a long and consistent gash is due to the fall of the spire from the North Tower. Look at this image. They're pretty close. Anyway, the south side of WTC-7 developed such a long breach of the perimeter columns. This is evident from this image. Here comes the most important stage of this video. Here is one famous photograph from the WT-7 debris. The I-shaped structure you see here are the girders of the building. Did you notice a strange 90 degree bent on them? How did this happen? The supporters of the control dimension theory has no answer for this strange bend. However, if you connect the dots logically, we will be able to solve this case. That music has a hypnotic effect when you got these wireless earbuds in. Um, but, uh, well, let's just get a reaction. Uh, Roland, we'll begin with you. This characterization of the fires in the building is, is uh, misleading. The fires on every one of those floors were the result of the burning of the contents of the building. In other words, the office furnishings, office furnishings were on fire. He would lead you to believe that those fires were long lasting and stationary. But all the evidence shows, and we know from our firefighting uh, friends, that the fires wouldn't burn in any one place for longer than about 30 minutes because they use up all the fuel. Whatever is burning is burned up. The fires then move because they follow where the fuel is uh, adjacent to them. So they'll move to that fire area and then they'll move on. So the fires were literally traveling around the building and they never burned in any one place for longer than about 30 minutes. Now these uh, steel frame members of the structure were fireproofed and they were fireproofed to withstand uh, a fire for about three hours, the main uh, structural elements. So there's no way that that fire could have caused sufficient heat to be transferred to the structural frame to cause it to weaken in the manner in which NIST uh, claims and which he is claiming in this in this matter, which he will, you will see later on. He says that in the lower part of the building where there weren't even fires, the uh, trusses were subjected to 600 degrees centigrade, which could not possibly happen under any circumstances with the fires in that building. So his characterization of the fires is completely wrong and misleading and deliberately so. Then he goes on to claim that if you look at the wreckage, you see these bent uh, members and that represents uh, the key to understanding uh, the progressive collapse, which he's going to explain later. Well, all that, <laughs> that, all that steel was hauled away. We have no way of knowing what those steel members represented, where they came from, or uh, in any way how they were connected with the process of the building collapse. So that's another misrepresentation. Why did they haul away all the uh, evidence? There's no, there's no way to claim that what he's showing you in those pictures was what he claims it represents. So that's two big misrepresentations in this part of the film. Right. I mean, he makes a big deal out of these bent trusses and the controlled demolition supporters can, you know, can't account for this. But I mean, the parts that we focus on, of course, are the physics. Uh, and what's funny is when you watch this entire video, I don't hear any mention of thermal expansion of beams, you know, framing into the girder, which is a big thing we focus on because NIST does, which is the initiating event. Very important. We just reran our silver bullets article on Halloween this year uh pointing to the problem at least a huge problem with that story the fires were burned out an hour before um but just you as the expert roland so the the this bent trusses issue i mean how significant is this just to reiterate 
to the entire argument for controlled demolition. Well, he's claiming that, as you'll see, as you go on to the interview, he claims that the uh, the trusses uh, caused uh, the uh, northeast corner of the building to actually move forward when it came down, and therefore the building did not collapse straight down into its own footprint. And it's probably true that some of the building uh, did have, there is evidence that there was a kink in the building, a horizontal kink in the uh, south face or in the north face as it came down. But that doesn't discount uh, controlled demolition. You'll see that in controlled demolitions too, because unless your placement of your explosives is exactly perfect, you're going to get some distortion as the building collapses. So he's using this as a way to discount the notion that controlled demolition could have been uh, the causative factor in bringing the building down. But his his evidence is, uh, first of all, his evidence was destroyed. His claim that what you're looking at is the bent beams in that particular part of the building is not verified by any evidence. And uh, he's, he's, he's attempting to build a story that will support the official theory by claiming that there are little problems with that official theory that they didn't go into, but he's discovered them through his uh, connection uh, with uh, this supposed expert that he <laughs> he claims he knew, uh, Joe Hill, who uh, I can't find any evidence of any person named Joe Hill. He said Joe Hill, unfortunately, died recently of cancer, and and he researched this for 15 years, and he's relying on Joe, Joe Hill's expertise. Well, who is Joe Hill? Who did Joe Hill work for? Was Joe Hill an engineer? Where, where, the, he, there's so many things here that are loose ends that you cannot explain that uh, it it becomes, you know, it, this is an exercise in in uh, in fantasy land. Well, I'm going to tell you if I pro look, you know, we're we're going to get to the end of this video tonight. But if I produce something like this for AE, you guys would be mad at me, uh, be for leaving all these loose ends out there. Kamal, your reaction to the segment and uh, anything Roland just said. Well, I, I, I agree with Roland. I, I'm going to pass on this one. Let me see the rest of the video. I'll, I have to admit that I haven't watched it until now. And <laughs> it's it's very entertaining, I must say. John? Yeah, the way he wants you to imagine how powerful the fires were and how you can just imagine what effect they had is all misdirection. As Roland said, we know what the office fires, you know, how they would, how they're characterized in a, in a situation like this, they burn up their fuel, they move on. And um, so it's just a lot of uh, misdirection here. Now with that, I've never heard before, and I could be corrected if I'm wrong here, I'm like, Roland, you might know, but I've never heard any claim that anybody found that TV antenna in the, in the destruction and uh, that that came down shearing the outer wall of World Trade Center 7. So that really surprised me. And um, uh, yeah, so it's, um, you know, again, it's just, I have to wonder why this fellow even wanted to make a video like this. You'll see in the whole thing, there's no calculations. There's actually no engineering discussion. It's, it's um, I don't know, it's just uh, artwork really. Hey, Roland, before we can play the next segment, I mean, can you address the point John asked about with that antenna? And, uh, I mean, how accurate is this, what he's laying out there? Nobody claims that that's what happened with the antenna. NIST doesn't claim that. Weidlinger, in their report, they don't claim that. Uh, Arab, they don't claim that. Nobody, nobody brings that point up. And it's a complete distraction because it has nothing to do with the way the building came down. Again, it has, it's like the, the transfer trusses at the bottom. Nobody claims that any that any of that structural damage, whatever it was, that caused from uh, Building Seven, which which FEMA characterized as minor damage, okay, and they don't point to any uh, evidence that the antenna came down and sheared every one of those uh, uh, beams all the way down the entire height of the building uh, with the with the uh, tip of the antenna. Not reasonable and. But more importantly, it's not even important. It doesn't matter. That's right. And yeah, again, a, focus, a big focus for us is the initiating event, which couldn't have happened, 
And even NIST says that the damage from the fall of Tower One uh, did not have any significant impact in initiating this building's collapse. They say it played a secondary uh, part in it, but has nothing to do with bringing about the, the start of this building's demise. You can look up NIST FAQ on Building 7 report, uh, number 16 on that. All right. Yeah, but one um, last thing, Andy. Ahead. I know, um, you know, uh, Dr. Holsey, who authored the definitive report on the nine on the World Trade Center seven collapse, he had often said if his students had done a job like NIST did, he would have given them an F and failed them. I can't even yeah. imagine there's a grade low enough he would have given this video. Yeah, well, this is going to get worse. So, okay, we're going to play the next segment. I guess we can call this one getting kinky. During the collapse, did you notice a kink at the top of the building? What's even more strange is the movement in the northeast corner of the building towards the left. How is such a wall movement possible? We don't see any such kink in this footage. What's going on here? In fact, this is a clear case of visual illusion. Take a look at the balcony of this apartment. Although you might believe that the balcony is bent downward, in reality, the balcony is bent inward. The camera angle causes such an illusion. Here also, the top edge of the building didn't bend down, but bent inward. More precisely, during the collapse, the northeast corner of the building moved forward, and a region in the north wall moved inward slightly. We'll learn the reason behind this strange inward wall movement very soon. When observing the deformation of this building from a bottom camera, we get the illusion of a kink at the top and the corner of the building moving towards the left. Now, let's review the entire sequence of the collapse to better understand how the girders bent heavily. The East Penthouse was added in the year 1989 to accommodate more cooling equipment. This is why the structural support of the East Penthouse looks slightly awkward. As we've seen previously, the weight of the East Penthouse was majorly carried by these three columns, the column numbers 79, 80, and 81. During the collapse of WTC 1 and 2, tons of debris entered the south side of this building. Over time, the temperature in the building's lower floors exceeded 600 degrees Celsius. Columns 79, 80, and 81 were already under huge stress due to the weight of the penthouse. With these steep increases in temperature, they eventually buckled, forming a V-shaped collapse on the penthouse. Once the core lost three columns, the remaining columns were under more stress. Remember, the next two sets of core columns are connected to the ground via transfer trusses. At the height of transfer trusses, the building temperature was quite high, and the transfer truss failed. This put the remaining columns into more stress, and the column collapse progressed. If you observe the collapse, you can see a small tilt to the top of the penthouse. This indicates that the core columns collapsed progressively. If the core columns had collapsed simultaneously, we would not have seen this small tilt. Let's turn our attention back to the second and third sets of core columns. The transfer truss is already broken. Can you predict the motion of the structures due to this failure? Without the transfer truss, the huge weight carried by columns 76 and 73 will make the horizontal girders bend. The perimeter columns 47 and 48 are directly connected with the horizontal girders. This means columns 47 and 48 have to bend inward during the building collapse. This is the reason one portion of the perimeter columns moved inward during the collapse. The same motion we observed in the real collapse footage. After all core columns collapse, will it be possible for the perimeter columns to bear the load of the whole building? Absolutely not. The perimeter tube alone is as weak as a cereal box. Okay, weak as a cereal box. Uh, I'm going to begin with Roland again. Obviously, I want to get your thoughts on the overall video, but I want to also ask you, you know, I've heard the kink referenced at times and stuff, but we don't talk about it much in these programs or when I bring you guys on here and we're talking about evidence. 
Um, he's saying it's an optical illusion and whatnot. Well, is there any relevance to our arguments about controlled demolition? One of the things that they do in controlled demolitions, which she doesn't mention here, of course, is that in buildings, high rise buildings that have a lot of heavy equipment uh, on the roof, as this building did with its uh, HVAC equipment in the uh, so called penthouses on the top, one of the things they do in controlled demolitions routinely is they place charges on the columns that are supporting that high up in the building. And they blow those first and drop that heavy equipment down through the roof, through the ceiling, into the structure of the building, so that when they then detonate the the, the uh, charges below and cause the building to come down, you don't have a large weight at the top of that building that could cause it to tip over. They don't want that building to tip over and cause damage to adjacent buildings. So they bring that penthouse down first commonly with charges at the top of the building. And then they bring the building down without having to worry about that weight toppling the building to one side. So that's, that's a common, actually the seeing that happen is a confirmation of the controlled demolition theory. Uh, NIST in the NIST uh, exam, uh, narrative, they try to make you believe that, well, it was fires on the 12th and 13th floor that caused the floors in the northeast corner of the building to collapse all the way down to the fifth floor. And that's what destabilized column 79. And that's what made it buckle because it had such a long slender length that was unsupported by floor connections. And then that in turn caused 80 and 81 to collapse. And then it went across uh, the whole core and then the rest of it came down. That's their explanation. But the contention that the failure of the connections on the 13th floor could then cause the penthouse to drop through the roof is extremely suspicious because there are 102 floor connections to uh, column 79 between the 13th floor and the roof. And they all stabilize and hold 79 in place, both laterally and also vertically. So the fact that they're claiming that they could take out the lower part of column 79 and 80 and 81 low down in the building, and that would cause the penthouse to fall through the roof is uh, unlikely. So yeah, yesterday when we were, oh, sorry. Uh, so I that's, say. that's one part of, their, uh, of, the, of the problem that they have. And he's trying to give a different explanation and say, well, uh, it was the fires at, at the lower part of the building that caused the collapse of 79 and then 80 and 81. There's no evidence of that. Nobody claims that. He's coming out of left field with that, with that fact, which is not a fact. And is, there's no evidence to support it. Right. I mean, is it relevant to the, to the weight of the building collapsed at all? These fires at the bottom and that it's, uh, you know, that this, uh, this heat down there, which again, there's no evidence of. Is it relevant though? It's irrelevant because, again, in his model, he doesn't show all the connections to column 79 all the way up the building. So when he says that fires in the trusses in the lower part would buckle and that would cause column 79 to buckle, that ignores all the connections to column 79 all the way up the building that would have stabilized it. So nobody ever claimed and nobody has claimed up until this guy that there were First of all, fires in the lower part of the building that were sufficient to weaken the trusses. And secondly, even if the trusses had collapsed, that that would cause the collapse of column 79. There's no evidence to support that, and it wouldn't work that way. Kamal, your thoughts? Well, I uh, again, I mean, I, I, this animation is, is made for amateurs. Um, you know, I like the way he shows his columns when he says the columns buckle. It's like he severs them. It's, that's not how, how things happen, but um, but you know, again, I guess he's trying in a way, even though not fully understanding perhaps the missed report, maybe he doesn't quite understand it. Um, but he's trying in a way to to defend the missed report because he's looking at the core column, column seventy nine collapsing, um, 
as a result of it buckling, so to speak. And when the when the column buckles, uh, it just it just kind of moves out of plane. And what, what then he's saying is that the so that this is the whole premise is the initiation of collapse, initiation of collapse that that Professor Professor Holsey proved that cannot happen, and that is when the girder uh, that's attached to column seventy nine is is unseated as a result of, of temperature expansion in the in the beams. And uh, what uh, what uh, Nero Halsey showed in, in his study is that that cannot happen because the expansion would push the building, the uh, the beams uh, would push the outside columns out as opposed to pushing the girder off the seat. So the column 79 could not have buckled to begin with. Uh, but, you know, again, I mean, assuming that that this, these columns buckle, and even if the entire building on the inside fails the way it has, and, and if you really want to be true to that, you really want to be true to that theory, then go with the NIST, uh, NIST animation model, which shows the building crumpling. Because the outside skin of the building is all of the connected. It's, it's it, all these, it's the, what, what, what they're called moment connections. So everything's welded together, and they can't just crumble. What happens is that if the inside of the building collapses, it's going to want to suck on the outside skin to basically close in on the building, which is what the NIST model shows. And then obviously this model never continued the collapse and it never explained how the global collapse really occurred. So, um, you know, I think he's trying to prove the NIST, the NIST model with, with extra beautiful animation that uh, basically is, is actually uh, deviating from the from the so which one is it? You know, are, do you want to prove the this model, or do you want to create an animation that doesn't make any sense? And maybe he doesn't even understand the NIST official story. You know, that happened with Michael Shermer, who's not an engineer, who came to Berkeley to give a talk, and he's given some BS explanation about the tower, about Building Seven, and it has nothing to do with what the official story was. It was an explanation NIST had abandoned early on, and I, I called him out for that. It's said, yeah, you got to know the official story you're defending first. And sometimes that happens. People just make an assumption about something and they just think it solidifies in their brain as, as what is the story when, uh, when it's not. John, your thoughts? Yeah, no, I've got really nothing more to add on, on this segment. I, something I had thought of on the previous segment about the fires, though, the fellow mentioned there, you know, the firefighters weren't fighting the fire, but there was water in the building to fight it. There was a, some of the sprinkler system was supplied from water from the top of the building, some domains from coming in under the street to the building, and water was available that day. It was claimed initially by some that there, the system lines were broken when the Twin Towers fell or there was no water available. That was later shown to be false. And what we do know is that somebody that morning put the fire sprinkler system into test mode. Nobody knows who that was, but it was in test mode, so it would never work that day. That's right. And yeah, Bravo 7 covers the water water issue. It's calling out Bravo 7, the film. Look it up on uh, YouTube. Well, YouTube's not going to help you, so you might have to jump through some hoops. But if you try hard enough and you believe in yourself, you can find it and watch it, because I think that's the most significant contribution that we've had to the truth movement uh, since the Halsey report is that segment where they talk about the what the water availability and how there was water to fight the fires. Um, all right, so we're going to get into free fall. Uh, well, they you know free fall speed. We'll uh, we'll talk about that, but let's play the segment first. So I think we're in segment number four here. With a lengthy gash on the perimeter tubes at the south side of the WTC seven building, it didn't fall perfectly down. Instead it twisted, with the northeast region of the perimeter tube moving towards the camera. This twisted motion of the perimeter columns is the reason why the girders bent almost 90 degrees. In other words, the twisted girders provide more evidence for the twisted movement of the perimeter walls. The twisting of the building skeleton is once again clear from this footage. You can even observe that the other corner is twisting away from the camera. In short, the WTC-7 didn't drop straight down, but with a heavy twist of its perimeter tubes, the northeast corner moved towards the camera and the other moved away. 
Did the WTC-7 come down at freefall speed? No, it did not. If you analyze the original footage of the collapse, the top 18 floors came down in 5.4 seconds. This time period is 40% more than the freefall time, which is 3.9 seconds. Most of the re-uploaded videos on YouTube are uploaded after increasing the footage speed by exactly 40%. A nice trick to bring the building down at freefall speed. If you compare the WTC-7 collapse with WTC-1 and 2, you'll be able to see the stark difference in the physics of the collapse. In WTC-1 and 2, during the collapse you won't observe any motion in the bottom region of the building. It's a top-down, progressive collapse. However, in WTC-7, without the core columns, the entire building went down together. In the location of WTC-7, currently you'll be able to see a taller building than this, the 7 World Trade Center. The previous electrical substation building is located inside the 7 WTC. The first 10 floors of this building is dedicated for the substation. The collapse of tin towers heavily damaged many more nearby buildings, WTC-3, WTC4, WTC5, and even WTC6. And you know what happened with WTC7. All these buildings were damaged to such an extent that they had to completely demolish it. Some of these buildings were later reconstructed. Okay, <clears throat> so yeah, there were other buildings that suffered damage and they were they burned and left these skeletons and may have had partial collapses in certain areas, but they didn't come down in this manner of building seven. Now what's interesting about this is no, it's not free fall speed. There's a lot of people that say that because that's sort of the, the meme that it got stuck in people's minds. It's free fall acceleration. Uh, Roland was, and I were talking about it yesterday and you said that uh, speed means velocity. Acceleration is increasing velocity. But it is free fall acceleration and this claim that, oh, because all of the videos that you see of Building 7 on YouTube, I mean, they, they've done everything they can to try to take them down. But all the videos that you find, all these people sped up the videos to try to give you this illusion that it's falling at the free fall speed. But actually, all the videos that have been measured are the same ones that came from the mainstream media that were filming them live there on the day. Uh, as it was happening. And I know when Chandler did his free fall analysis that he was using mainstream media footage of that and explains his entire process. But Roland, I'm going to, you explain this better than I do. So I'm going to let you do it, give you the floor, talk about your reactions to that segment. Well, the, if he's going to defend the official narrative of how this building came down, he has to somehow get rid of the idea that free fall acceleration existed. Now, it was Chandler that pointed out uh, in 2005 that if you actually take the measurement of the video, then you know that they're being filmed at 29 frames per second, and you put a tracking device on that, you can measure the acceleration of the building as it comes down, and that's what he did. So there's no, nobody's ever claimed that, gee, Chandler was so dumb that he didn't know the uh, the videos that he were tracking were not uh, had been sped up forty percent. No, NIST didn't claim that. In fact, NIST had to admit that he was right. And what his video evidence showed was that for approximately two and a quarter seconds at the beginning of the near the beginning of the descent of the building, it fell at absolute free fall acceleration. Not the entire thing, because of course. Even in a controlled demolition, after you've removed the section of the building that you want to, when the upper part falls and hits the lower part, it's going to slow down. So, no, it didn't fall at free fall acceleration for the entire height of the building. It only fell for about eight stories before it began to slow down. But those eight stories at free fall, there's no explanation for that. If, if there's any building there at all to... Uh, deter the fall, it's going to slow it down, and free fall is not going to be possible absent uh, that. Uh, if, if, there's no, if there's no resistance, that's the only way you're going to get free fall. Mm -hmm. So NIST never addressed that afterwards. Even NIST admitted that Chandler was right, and they put it in their report. If you look at the NIST report, they show you free fall acceleration in the same way that Chandler did. So they admit it. They never 
They never, uh, well, Sunder says at one point in his explanation, well, free fall acceleration would indicate that there was no structure below it. So he admits that. Then they admit that there was free fall for two and a quarter seconds. Well, what happened to the structure for eight stories? So this whole part, this is the essential part of this narrative is that they have to destroy free fall acceleration and they lead you to believe that because we measure it from here, 18 stories down, and it doesn't fall the entire way under free fall acceleration, that means that there was no free fall acceleration. But there was free fall acceleration for two and a quarter seconds. That means there was no building there for eight stories. That's the essential point here. Right. And he's saying speed, and he's making this argument that they sped it up. Now he should know he should know better as an engineer not to talk about free fall speed. Any that's that's an indication right. that he really doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, you know, yesterday, and I wrote this down because when we were watching this, you said, you know, using an average of over 5.4 seconds, but not analyzing frames to see how acceleration changed over time. As a trained mechanical engineer, he knows better than this and knows it's a trick. Uh, so this is basically a straw man. Uh, he's claiming that we, we, we see free fall for the entire fall when we're really talking about eight stories here. Uh, and it's just diverting. Come on, your thoughts on what we just watched. Well, I think it's it's all semantics. It's irrelevant. Uh, Three point nine seconds, five point four seconds for the entire for the entire collapse is irrelevant. The building was brought down with controlled demolition. So you know, told them. I mean, it's a very it doesn't prove anything that that the entire collapse is five point four as opposed to three point nine. You know, when you, when you say free fall speed, too, uh, you, you've got to consider wind resistance and everything else, too. So it's not pure acceleration. Right. I mean, you know, most, I mean, the, most of the video is kind of cute seeing them try to debunk our arguments. But this is the point at which the video jumps the shark saying, oh, all those videos were sped up. So, no, you're just watching a another illusion created by all these tricksters on the Internet who have nothing better than to do than talk about this for 15 years. You know, but all the again, all that footage came from mainstream media. Uh, John, your thoughts on that segment? Well, right. I that was just such a bizarre statement that. Every video you see was sped up exactly 40% by uh, some some cabal out there that got together to do this. So anyway, that was odd. But also, I, I, when I watched this um, the first time, I was thinking maybe that 5.4 second versus the 3.9 came because when you watch this video, you see the penthouse collapse first. And then nothing happens for a little bit before the entire building comes down. So I, I believe, and again, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but that free fall acceleration is taken from when the roof line of the building begins to collapse, not when that, you know, like Roland pointed out, typically done in controlled demolition, you take out some key elements of weight, not when the penthouse started to come down. So I think, I was thinking that was his misdirection there. He's going from the time the first penthouse, the penthouse started to collapse, you know, that, and that's where he got a longer duration, but that's an incorrect analysis. Yeah. Um, well, let's go ahead and just play the last segment. This is not very long at all, but he's going to talk about Joe Hill. I just want to say I played the entire video here on the focus for the audience that we didn't skip anything. We didn't edit anything. So here we go. His respect to Joe Hill. Before I end this video, I would like to pay tribute to a man who taught me a lot about different structural movements of WTC 7, Mr. Joe Hill. Joe Hill passed away around three months back after a long fight with cancer. The greatness of Joe Hill was that he never enforced his conclusions on me. Instead, he proved me logically, with help of photography and video evidence, what's the nature of WTC 7 collapse. And this man spent his last 15 years of his life studying and analyzing WTC 7 collapse, also writing about it. Mr. Joe Hill, I will always cherish the long email conversation with you. And uh, thank you for all your support. Okay, I have no idea who Joe Hill is. I tried to do some research since we uh, talked about it yesterday. I, I found something that took me to a YouTube channel that might be Joe Hill's, but I have no idea who this guy is. I know, Roland, you, you didn't seem to. Have you found out anything about who Joe Hill is in the no. 24 hours? 
No. You guys, John or Kamal, you know who he is? No. Okay. Well, you know, if this if this is information that he's repeating from Joe Hill, I'm sorry he passed away, but Joe Hill was very wrong. And I don't know what Joe Hill's engineering credentials are, uh, but if this is what he's he's passing on, then uh, his information is not correct. And there are so many other factors involved in this as well. I mentioned, again, the fires were burnt out an hour before Building 7 came down. You don't have raging fires. You don't have thermally expanding beams. And you don't have a girder being pushed off of its seat. So, I mean, that's not even the only point there, but this has been long debated, long discussed. The University of Alaska report has proven that uh, in order for the building to come down the way that we saw it, you have to remove all of the support columns virtually at, all, at the same time uh, in order to match that video. And of course, NIST animation stops right as the their own animation betrays what we actually saw that day. Uh, so... I just want to say, I mean, is there anything accurate or redeeming about this video at all, guys? I mean, something we can throw this guy. Well, I think he, you know, he points out the nature of the uh, foundation, the way that some of the columns had to be attached to transfer trusses and then uh, routed around the uh, station, the substation in order to get to the ground. Okay, that might be new information for a lot of people. Nobody's focused on it before because it doesn't have anything to do with the analysis of uh, why the building came down. This wasn't a foundation failure. It wasn't a foundation in the lower floors of the building. Uh, it was a sudden global collapse in which the top part of the building fell at two and a quarter seconds at free fall acceleration. There's only one way to explain that. That's removal of eight floors. Now, can you guys see, though, how a largely non-engineering audience could be oh, yeah. swayed by something like this? I oh, mean, yeah. you know, somebody who's coming across this for the first time and it's like, oh, my God, that guy's got a fancy looking channel. I mean, it's boasting being the most important or largest or whatever engineering <laughs> engineering YouTube channel on YouTube. Um you know, I mean, people uh, get swayed by this because it's got a lot of fancy graphics. It's got a lot of uh, uh, diversion, uh, sleight of hand. And, you know, these arguments being made that are completely irrelevant to the case uh, that we are presenting. And this bogus information claiming, oh, you know, all those mainstream media uh, footage that we have of Building 7. And even though the whole process was explained when uh, they came to free fall, I determined that free fall happened for eight stories, even though NIST acknowledged it. It's all because everybody is a trickster on YouTube and they sped up the footage. Um, yeah, people who want to believe the official story will seize on that and cognitive dissonance will set in. Uh, guys, do you have any final thoughts? I would just like to say one final thing, and that is I noticed in the corner of his video, he's, he's calling his firm civil engineering. He doesn't have the legal right to do that. He's not a civil engineer. He's a mechanical engineer. There are differences in their training and in their uh, understanding of the way structures work, of course. But for him to re represent his analysis as a civil engineering uh, analysis is wrong, and it's actually illegal. He can't claim to be a civil engineer. He doesn't have the credential to be one. Well, I mean, again, his website claims a, it's about robotics, so maybe he could make me a nice uh, robot to bring me a drink or something if I get hot. But, uh, but I, you know, some of that is pretty irrelevant. Now, look, if he actually had a deep analysis that he was presenting here, I, I would ignore that. I'd say, okay, you know, he does robotics and he's really studied this. But none of the stuff that he's presenting here makes any real sense. Again, a lot of the information is really irrelevant. And, I, you know, there's a, assumptions made without any real evidence to back it up in this. It's sort of just like a guess at what, you know, what, what, you're, uh, what you want to have happened within the building. But you got to actually prove it. You can't just come up with a theory and say, okay, this is what happened. Yeah. Um, you got to actually prove it. Go ahead, yeah, I think Roland is more generous than I would be. I, I can't think of anything redeeming about this. But I will say, you know, since we know what the facts are and the realities and how bad this is, but we can see how people would be swayed who aren't familiar with the, the 
the facts and don't have the training. It makes me wonder, though, it does serve this purpose. It makes me wonder how much else I see out there portrayed where I'm not have any kind of training in. Wow. I wonder how easily I'm swayed by other stuff out there. Yeah. Well, you know, some of it, you know, there's probably a lot. There's a lot of people, you know, speaking out of. uh Oh, I can't use that word on the on the air here, but you know, speaking out of other parts of their body on many many different things. I mean, you'll watch some video on YouTube where the a, a speck of dust will go by a camera lens, and they'll say, "Oh my God, it's a ghost orb!" And YouTube will promote that. You know, they'll say this is great information, top notch research, and it's a load of malarkey. And people watch it because it's exciting and fun for them or whatever. But here we are presenting a very sober and uh, research back case on a very important event, and we have to deal with these hurdles. We are the invisible men, and this stuff gets promoted to the top because they think it's going to sway people. So, I want to tell our audience before we close out you got to help us. We got to beat the machine. Throw yourself against the gears of the machine, as some famous person once said. How do you do that? You got to share this video. Be polite. I can't stop you if you're not, but be polite. But Put this in the comments of the uh, this WTC7 video from Seven Civil Engineering. Should be easy to find, easier to find than my show. But put it right there in the comments and show that there is some resistance there. But guys, thank you so much for doing this with us tonight and for coming on the focus. And we'll see you next time you're on the show.